It's been a privilege to share fellowship with you again today, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, share with you again this evening. <coughs> if you were here this morning, um, we were looking at the exclusive claims of Jesus uh, as they recorded in John chapter 14, uh, where he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Uh, and there are more exclusive claims in the passage that we um, have in, in front of us in, in Matthew chapter 11. We haven't read all of the chapter, but I'll refer to some of it in a moment. But uh, again, you see the exclusivity that Jesus claims for himself. Um, he says this, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and he to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So Jesus is claiming that, again here, that you cannot know God unless God has willingly revealed who Christ is to you. Uh, it's that same note of exclusivity. But in the, the broader context of the passage, um, it really begins in, in verse 1, when Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. So Jesus is, is on a mission, and sometimes uh, missions are very, very encouraging, aren't they? And sometimes they're less than encouraging. Uh, and uh, most of the gospel writers, John in particular, is always drawing our attention to the fact that uh, whenever Jesus speaks, it has two reactions that happen on, on almost every occasion. There are those who believe and come into the, the group of disciples, and there are others who reject. Uh, and sometimes I, I think we can be guilty of thinking that if we're not seeing success, it, the problem lies with us. Well, it may lie with us. It may be that the way we're witnessing is not wise, is, is not good, is not godly, but this is the reality of life. Some will receive and some will reject, uh, and the reason is given to us there because the Father needs to reveal himself through the Son in order that people might come to salvation there are discouragements in the passage prior to the little section that we're going to look at, which is really verses 28 and 29. Let me just read that so that you know where we're aiming to get. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy." and my burden is light. Hardly has uh, Jesus begun his message uh, and his proclamation around the cities than he receives some emissaries from John the Baptist. Um, previously, John the Baptist had been pointing to Jesus. Um, disciples had been abandoning him, as they should do, uh, and attaching themselves to Jesus. Uh, and John had been making his, his great statements, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John is now in prison. Uh, and so he sends emissaries with this message. Uh, and I often wonder how how that was received by Jesus, whether it, it, it actually hurt his heart, whether he wondered, but of course he knows everything that is in men's hearts. But John sends a message, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? John is looking for reassurance. He needs reassurance at this moment. He's going to seal his ministry with his own life before long, uh, and he needs to know. And all Jesus does is to tell the emissaries to have a good look around them, see what is happening, and go back and report it to John, because this is the fulfillment of prophecy, and they do. But he receives um, endless criticism from people around him, the religious leaders and, uh, and, and others. Uh, Matthew eleven eighteen 18 to 19 is an example. They say, Jesus says of them, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, 
a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. In other words, whatever God's messenger does, it's going to be wrong. If he comes in an ascetic way like John, that's wrong. Who, who would behave like that except a madman? I mean, who would stand in the River Jordan all day telling people to come and dipping them under the wall? It's madman's language. And then Jesus comes sitting and eating with tax collectors and sinners, and they say, well, just look at him. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And sometimes I think we feel we can't win. Um, whatever it is we say, whatever it is we do. And Jesus responds to that in a very, very strong way. He addresses the, the, the cities that surround the, the Sea of Galilee, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and his own hometown of Capernaum, born in Nazareth, but as a man, he lived in Capernaum. And, and he says to them, it's going to be so hard for you in the day of judgment, because if these pagan cities, if even Sodom, destroyed for its evil, had seen the mighty works that you've seen, they would have repented and believed. But you haven't. And he's underlining there for us that the, the greater the revelation people have seen, the, the more clearly, with their minds at least, they've understood the gospel, the greater condemnation rests on them when they refuse it. So he brings out these, these uh, condemnations of the, the cities, telling them um, that it will be more tolerable on the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And then comes this amazing invitation that Jesus makes. I, I want to alter slightly the order um, of the, the thing and look at the problem first before we look at the solution. The, the problem is that people labor and are heavy laden, and they have no rest. And that is the, the situation, isn't it, that we, we find people, generally speaking, are in. They're, they're laboring. Matthew 6, 28 says this, Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil, which is the, the same word that's, that's translated as burden and so on, and is the, the heart of this problem. Heavy laden people, anxious people, people toiling. And, and that in itself can be used in, in all sorts of different ways. Um, John 4, the story of the <coughs> woman at the well, tells us that Jesus was wearied. He was, <coughs> excuse me, wrong point in it again. In goes the sweet. See if it works like it did this morning. settled the tickle this morning, so I'm hoping it'll do so again. Uh, we read in, in John 4 and verse 6 that Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the wall. Jesus lived a, uh, an action-packed life in a sense. He was always um, being harassed by people, um, pressed towards in, in great throngs. Uh, the scriptures are full of examples, aren't there, of him hardly being able to move people wanting their children blessed, uh, women with issues of blood just wanting to touch him. Uh, and little wonder, there were times when he was wearied uh, and he, he sat down and he sent his disciples off. Uh, one of the remarkable things about John 4, I think, is how animated Jesus becomes when this sinful woman comes out and starts to engage him in conversation because what you see at the end is not a weary Jesus kind of, you know, slumping um, on the bench at the side of the well. It's a Jesus engaging with her, um, showing her her need and so on, and bringing her into a, an incredible place of, of revelation. 
The, the word labor here literally means to grow weary, to lose heart, to be emotionally fatigued and discouraged. Does all that sound totally alien to you? Never had a day in your life when you felt that you were growing weary, losing heart, becoming emotionally worn out, and maybe discouraged. If you are, you're better than me. Because I think most of us have known that kind of um, situation. And Jesus here, uh, some of the, the translations um, use different words here. The, the NET Bible, the NET Bible, uses the word burdened. Are you weary and burdened, says Jesus? I will give you rest. The, the New Living Translation, or sorry, New Literal Translation says, then Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. It, it's a, a common human condition to be in. Sometimes it, it comes simply because people are overworked. They're, they're just doing too much, uh, and the demands that they're putting on their bodies and on their, their mental kind of capacity is, is simply too much. The writer of Ecclesiastes says this in, in Ecclesiastes 2.11, then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil, that's that word again, I had expended in doing it. Behold, all was vanity, and a striving after the wind and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. He's saying, I, I, I took a step back, I looked at my life, and I thought, this is meaningless. What's the point of all this? He was just overworked and, and, and anxious. Deuteronomy 1 verses 9 to 12 says, at that time I said to you, I am not able to bear you by myself. This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. May the Lord your God of your fathers make you a thousand times as many as you are, and bless you as he has promised you. How can I bear by myself the weight and burden of you and your strife? It's the heart of a, of a leader there crying out and saying, look, my job's hard enough as it is. Please don't make it any harder. Your strife is adding to the burden of what I'm doing. And uh, you'll remember the advice of his father-in-law. You, you're going to kill yourself if you keep going on like this. You, you need to appoint other people. Trust them. This is why in the New Testament, there are always a multiplicity, plurality of elders, that the, the work and the burden of the church might be shared. Sometimes... Uh, people can consider themselves to be a burden or others can consider them to be a burden. Uh, I think it's one of the real issues um, surrounding what is now moved somehow from being euthanasia to being assisted dying. Uh, and the, the debate, one of the, the problems is the, the fear that people who feel themselves to be a burden may decide to opt for assisted dying, not because they actually want to end their lives at that moment, but because they've come, possibly by coercion, possibly not by coercion, they've just come to the point where they think, I'm a burden. My family would be better off without me. When David was fleeing from Absalom, into Samuel 15, Hushai the archite um, said, you know, I'll come with you. Uh, and David wisely said to him, if you go on with me, you'll be a burden to me. Stay here. There's something for you to do here, but I appreciate your loyalty and wanting to come into exile with me. But truthfully, you'd just be a burden. Uh, and so he, he didn't go. Sometimes, um, being heavy laden refers to being oppressed. This was the, the cry of the children of Israel, wasn't it? In, in their bondage in, in Egypt, they set taskmasters over them, we read, to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. There can be personal grief of all sorts that becomes an almost intolerable burden for us. Um, we, we find this in 1 Samuel with Hannah. 
She is so grieved that she is not conceiving a child. She's not a mother. And uh, Alkana's kindly meant words, uh, you know, am I not more better to you than, than, than a you know, handful of children? No, she's saying, it's not that I don't love you, but no, my soul longs for a child. And of course, Penina, her rival wife, never loses an opportunity of twisting the knife. Uh, and poor old Hannah becomes so distressed that she, she goes to the tabernacle and <clears throat> you'll know how she, she prays, um, but her lips are not moving and, and Eli, the old priest, um, thinks that she's drunk uh, and tells her not to behave in, in that kind of way. But she pours out her heart uh, and she's, this is the burden that she has. She says she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Uh, and it may be that sometimes we ourselves or others that are close to us will find that um, we're just so weary. We, we don't know what to do or where to go. Sometimes it can be spiritual pressures, can't it? One of the things that angered the Lord Jesus about the, the Pharisees and the, uh, the scribes and the other religious leaders was that they created burdens that they put on people. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little bylaws, for want of a better word, interpretations of the law that, that meant that people had to be trying to think of all these little things. Were they pleasing God when they did this, when they did that, when they did the other? And Jesus said to them, scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat and observe whatever they tell you but not the works that they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. Very clever people who could put a burden onto everyone else while finding little loopholes in their own created laws to slide out at the side. But of course, the biggest burden of them all is a genuine burden. It's the, the burden of sin. In Psalm 38, the psalmist says, O oh Lord, <clears throat> rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come upon me. There's no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. That's actually a great place to be, isn't it? When people are in the position that um, they, they are saying, my, my burden is too heavy for me. Charles Spurgeon let me just read something from a, a little potted biography of Charles Spurgeon. He, says, he experienced a deep burden of sin and a quest for salvation starting at the age of 10. For five years, he grappled with the heavy realization that he was not a true Christian. His conversion came unexpectedly during a snowstorm when he sought refuge in a small church service where a layman's simple message to look to Jesus Christ resonated with him. This led to a profound moment of salvation for Spurgeon, lifting the burden of sin and filling him with unparalleled joy. The experience marked a significant turning point in his life, illustrating the transformative power of a simple yet powerful message. We will encounter people with burdens, I think sometimes our default position as Christians, isn't it, is to pray that God would remove the burden. But sometimes it's worth just questioning whether that burden has actually been placed on them by God. It was certainly true of the Egyptians in Egypt. Um, the, the, the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the heavier the burden, the more they cried out to God so that God was able to say, I have heard the cry of my people and I am come down to deliver them. 
Uh, and there are times, I think, when it would be wise for us to caveat our, our prayers where we, we want to say, Lord, heal this person. Lord, give that person a bigger, better job with a one more wonderful salary. Lord, sort this out, sort that out. Sometimes the providence of God is most precious when it seems burdensome because his ultimate design is not our comfort but our salvation. He wants us to know him whom to know is everlasting life. Now, it isn't for us to make those decisions, uh, but it is for us to, to pray uh, and to pray in such a way that we are saying to the Lord, Lord, you know this situation. You know what my heart would be. Fulfill your perfect will and perfect purpose in this person's life, in my life. Uh, and when it is in my life, to accept that if God does not lift the burden, then the purpose of that burden has not yet been fulfilled. Uh, and to move on in faith and in trust. There's one other way in which um, burden is, is sometimes used, and uh, again, it's a significant one. Very often, um, prophets speak, Malachi 1.1 is a good example, the oracle of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Uh, and that word is sometimes translated as the burden of the Lord. God lays burdens on his people's hearts, on his servant's heart. Jeremiah 23, when one of the people or a prophet or a priest asks you, what is the burden of the Lord? Then you shall say to them, you are the burden and I will cast you off, declares the Lord God. Or, or chapter 20 and verse 9, I will not mention him, says Jeremiah, or speak any more in his name. There is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary with holding it in. I cannot. Jeremiah at one point was saying, the burden that God's laid on me, it's too heavy. I can't go on, so I'm going to quit. I'm not going to be a prophet any longer. But God placed such a burden on him, such a weight on his heart that he says, I can't keep quiet. I've got to speak. Paul is saying something similar, isn't he, in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul is a man under divine compulsion, and he must serve his God. So if that's the problem, what's the solution? Uh, and again, it, it links in with what I was trying to say this morning, the solution is Christ himself. Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor. Not, not come to church, not accept this group of, of, of doctrines, not, not any of those things, but come to me. It's a personal invitation to a personal relationship with the living God. Uh, it, it's, it's not new. Psalm 55 and verse 22 reads, cast your burden where? On the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Or Isaiah 10, in that day, his burden will depart from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because of the fat. God only places burdens on his people until their work is done. Uh, and when that work is done, the Lord swiftly removes the burden and brings in his grace uh, and his mercy and his comfort. Uh, the balm of Gilead is applied to the wounds that God has laid upon his own people. But men are so reluctant, aren't they, to listen to God? So reluctant to reshape the invitation here in Matthew 11. Uh, and so it seems that the default position of people is to go to themselves to lift the burden. And it's almost become, hasn't it, the, the religious dogma of our own day. You know, the answer lies within you. Find your inner person. You know, be who you are. Liberate yourself. It's all me and what I can do. And what God is saying to us is that the 
the malady, the sickness that we're suffering from it is too grave for us as individuals to deal with it. it. It's no good coming to us because all that will mean is, is well, probably one of two things, maybe more. Either we'll start depending on works. We'll believe that we can try harder. Try harder. You, you often hear people giving that advice, isn't it? But try harder. And, and you think, I, I can't try any harder. I'm, I'm exhausted with trying already. Paul tells us that the works of the flesh, they're no good. They, they, they will save no one. Or we look to our own righteousness. We, we, we try and delude ourselves that we are. Works means we're trying to become what we know we should be. Uh, and and self-righteousness is already concluding that we are what we should be. Neither works, because salvation is found in no one but the Lord Jesus Christ, as our verse this morning said, the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, and we quote it as well, Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But what happens, this is the, the, the last point I want to make, what happens when we do come to Jesus, when aware of this burden that's pressing us down, that's crushing us into the ground, what happens when we come to him? Uh, and what scripture says is, I will give you rest. You, you notice it's not the rest of the graveyard, because there's still a yoke, uh, and we're still... Like oxen, if, if we're using that picture, we're still plowing away. Um, but now the yoke is not crippling us. Now the, lo the yoke is easy. The burden is being borne by someone else. But we're, we've not drifted into total inactivity. And um, we're still productive and active. But now everything we do is done not in our own strength, but in the strength of Christ. So rest doesn't mean inactivity. It can't do, because it can it? Because um, if you think about it, uh, the first kind of reference to it is, is Genesis 2, isn't it? 2 and 3. On the seventh day, God finished his work and all that he'd done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. If God had suddenly gone to his armchair for a nap, the entire universe would have, I don't know, spun into nothing, wouldn't it? It is held by his power. So God's rest does not refer to God's inactivity. It can't do. Jesus says, my father works and I work still. God never ceases to work. He never ceases to sustain. He never ceases to keep. It's just that he rested from his works of creation. Resting in the sense of security comes in the, the next kind of references to it, which are in Genesis 8 and the um, story of the, the, the universal flood. Uh, Noah sends out the dove, you remember, uh, and it comes back. But there was nowhere for it to rest and so it returned. There, there was nowhere for it to, to perch itself. There, there, was, there was no end to its constant searching. And God in his grace has provided us, hasn't he, with the, the Sabbath day uh, as, as a rest day, or the Lord's day uh, as a rest day, to keep it holy. I, I've just been looking at a, a book which has been published in the United States until recently and it is no longer available there. So um, at day one, we're going to, to publish it. It's got the lovely title of Celebrating the Sabbath. Uh, and I really enjoyed reading it because it was kind of saying, you know, that this is not, I heard somebody uh, quote recently that the popular view of the Puritans is that they live their lives in fear, afraid that somewhere somebody was happy. Uh, which I think is a gross misinterpretation of the Puritans. Um, but it, it, it's the idea that sometimes you get from people. Uh, and the idea of, of Sunday, uh, I know when I was a youngster, I, I grew up in a non-Christian home. Uh, and Sunday was a dreadful day. 
You weren't allowed to do anything. You just had to sit there. And my parents didn't go to church, so we didn't go to church. But you weren't allowed to go out to play. You weren't allowed to do this. You weren't allowed to do that. It was a whole list of what you're not allowed to do. Uh, and when we had our children, we made it our, our aim in life to make Sunday a great day. Uh, a, a day when we could worship the Lord. A day when that it, it was a good day. Just to show how sad um, Chris and I have become over the, the years when COVID came and we got totally lost. You know, which day, what day is it? I have no idea what day it is. Um, but there was one thing that needed to still go on. The bins had to go out. So how did we know what day the bin was going to go out? And I actually, this is absolutely true, I laminated a series of things that said Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and we propped them up. But the last one, just said, I love Sundays. And that one gets propped up still now. COVID's gone. Um, but we still put these little things on the little calendar next to it when we have to tell it what the date is. Uh, and we do it. And then today, if you go into our lounge, it'll say, I love Sundays. Because it's a gift from God, isn't it? Something we should really cherish and enjoy, and not least it means that we can rest from our works. We don't have to strive to earn salvation. It's not what we do, it's what he has done. That's the glory of the gospel. That's the wonder of the rest. And of course, looking onwards, the writer to the Hebrews tells us that there remains a rest for the people of God. Everything we've got now, as good as it is, is only a taster of what is to come. And some of it is wonderful, isn't it? I love Hebrews 12. What have we been doing today? Well, this is the writer to the Hebrews thing on it. He says, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That's what the church is. It's not Sinai with its threatenings. It's not the burden of seeking to create a righteousness of our own so that we can approach God and be accepted. It's resting in the finished work of Christ. It's trusting that he has already done everything that needs to be done. The, the great Puritan theologian John Owen says this, that spiritual rest of God, which believers obtain an entrance, by which, sorry, believers ent obtain an entrance into Jesus Christ in the faith and worship of the gospel and is not to be restrained unto their eternal rest. He's saying there, look, you don't have to wait for heaven to get a taste of it. You can be part of the community of God's people. You can be involved in the worship of God. You can sing to your heart's content. You can read the scriptures and feast on the word of God you can anticipate all that's to come. And you can do it knowing that everything promised will come. As long as that first step has been taken and you've come to him, to Jesus, the only name by which we can be saved. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we... Thank you for the glory of the gospel. We thank you for the wonder of who our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. And we thank you for the, oh, the amazing promises that he's made to us. The invitation to come to him with the knowledge that we have been healed by his stripes. That our iniquity has been laid upon him. And so we can approach the Father, with confidence, knowing that our sins and our iniquities will be remembered no more, not because of what we've done. Help us, Lord, to lay down the burden of sin at the all-sufficient feet 
of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and find in him present rest and the assurance of future eternal rest. Amen.